Right, let's look at the agenda. This is the scrutiny audit on Tuesday, 16th of June, slightly later than we intended. Uh, any apologies or substitutions, Karen? Apologies from Councillor Mark Salmond. Convener, can I just refer back to a couple of points for housekeeping? Yes, yeah, sorry, I forgot about that. It took so long to get in. Shall it's I do it? Of, yes, right, you do it. Right, um, members and officers, just to note that the meeting will be recorded to comply with Local Government Scotland Act. Um, elected members will be unmuted, and so will some officers, but should any member press mute during the meeting, you'll require to raise your uh, hand, which is at the bottom of your screen under the participant list, um, because you'll not be able to unmute yourself again. If any member leaves the meeting, can you please highlight to, to myself? And should any member or officer um, have any points or questions raised, can you please raise the blue hand at the bottom of the screen? I think possibly, um, convener, that could well be the police that's maybe trying to call me. Because okay. I don't think the police are actually in. I hadn't seen them. They're not in, Karen. Right, well, Karen's trying to sort the police out. No. No. Can I ask everybody to make sure they have clicked on the participants at the bottom, oh, halfway along the bar at the bottom. That should give you a list of participants uh -huh. down the right hand side. That one has the facility to raise your hand if you want to speak. If you want to speak, Bill, at the moment. I'm just going to do declarations of interest. Uh, yeah, right. okay, sorry. You were ahead of me. Convener, sorry, can I interrupt? Sorry. Yeah, carry on. I've got the police on the phone. They can't actually get into the actual meeting. Ali, is there any issues? Not that I'm aware of. They should just be able to dial the 0131 number and get in, like they did the other day. Hi, Andrew. Did you dial the 0131 number that is on the bottom of the invitation? And then they would need to put in the pass the passcode in the and then the password. Okay, hold on a second. Right, the telephone number. Um, could you repeat that again, sorry, Andrew? 0131 460. That is the correct number, and then the password is. There'll be a meeting code yeah. number first, and then what? a passcode. Okay, sorry. Okay, and the. All right, then you don't get as far as that. Right, okay. Um, can I try and forward it on to you again, just in case there is anything? <clears throat> okay, thank you. Bye. Convener, sorry. Um, Andrew Todd, I'm going to, to send a link to Andrew Todd again, um, and he's going to try that link again. But he's actually not getting past the first stage. I'm just wondering if the other option would be if I can get them to just to pull me back on my mobile. Okay, that's one option. The other one is they may have to go in through um, their Google or something like that to Zoom. That's the way I had to do it. I wasn't picking up on your link. And I okay, had to come okay. in by going into Google and opening up Zoom. They might not want to do that, convener, though. Okay, that's fair enough. But if we can get audio from them, that'll do. Okay. I'll send it to him now and I'll ask him if he doesn't have that, if he can phone me back and we can just put them on loudspeaker, would that be acceptable? That would be fine. Karen, I'm just going to 
are and is it only like Andrew Todd that's coming in? Uh, I think they're both in the same room, Fiona. Right, okay, because I'm happy to take a call. Let me know when you're ready to proceed, Gordon. Yeah, sorry, I'll just give him the, the details so he's got them again. And do you want me to um, ask the convener to proceed with the declarations and I'll take a note of the declarations? Well, yeah, that's fine. I, yeah, I'm, I'm actually back on now. I've actually sent all the details to um, Andrew Todd. That's me back, sorry. Ready Good to go. To, ready, to, ready to proceed, Karen? Yes, please, convener, sorry. Right, uh, next item is declarations of interest. Councillor uh, Dorff. Yeah, thanks, convener. Just uh, item six, um, report um, one five seven twenty, uh, Angus Alive annual report. I'm a council appointed director, no financial interest, and will participate. Thank you, Councillor Devine. It's the same for me, convener. One five seven twenty, a council uh, appointed a board member of Angus Alive. Right. Councillor Bell. Thank you. Um, item 10, 13 and 14, I'm a council appointed member of the Angus Health and Social Care Partnership. Um, general dispensation, no financial interest and will participate and vote if necessary. Thanks. Thank you. Um, can I try, wait a minute, I've got, I think I've got Police Scotland. Is that Police Scotland on the phone? Yeah, Wayne Morrison and Andrew Todd, apologies for the delay. Okay, we can hear you. Thank you. Right. Okay. Is there any other declarations? Okay. Minute of the previous meeting. Is that a correct minute? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, right. Item four is the Scottish Fire and Rescue Services monitoring report. Uh, can I ask Gordon Pride to speak to that, please? Ali, could you unmute Gordon, please? And Scott Gibson. And Scott. Thank you very much, convener. Can you hear me okay? Yes, can hear you fine, thank you. Thank you. Well, before I ask members to note and comment on the report, I'd like to inform uh, members that it had been my aim to initiate a review of the local fire plan for Angus prior to, to this point. However, I've had to put it on hold for a short period while we worked through this uh, period of COVID, uh, looking at our national and local recovery plans. I'm almost in a position to allow me to start that initial review, just to ensure that our priorities remain relevant for the following year, 2021, and really just to ensure our targets are uh, correctly set. I would anticipate there will be significant changes to our strategic plans and other local plans as we move forward through the recovery phase, so we will address them as and when they arise. Uh, returning to the report, there are a few areas I'd like to comment on prior to asking Scott to offer further details. On page 17 of the papers, that's page 6 of the uh, Fire Service report, we offer a performance uh, summary of our information, and this is a, a year-to-date information. Uh, of the 12 key indicators, we've identified nine are positive to the end of the year and are below the, the target. Uh, two of the other three are uh, slightly above target, which is less than 10% above target, and they are non-domestic uh, building fires and unwanted fire alarm signals. And then the final one, which is above 10% above target, that's a deliberate primary fires. Some of this performance we are reporting on uh, please, uh, is very pleasing with significant reductions, especially around the number of people injured during accidental dwelling fires over the past 12 months. However, one uh, probably note of caution is since the lockdown, there has been an increase nationally 
in the number of uh, severe fires involving people and fatal fires. And as a service, we've launched a national campaign around making the call. And this allows us, to, or this is encouraging us to target people who are over 50, smoke and live alone, with a focus on those with either mobility issues or medical issues. So again, we'd welcome uh, uh, support from communities just to identify those that are most vulnerable, just so we can get that uh, the supporting information out to them. So really just, I'd now like to pass on to Scott Gibson just to offer some more detail on the report itself. Scott. Thanks, Gordon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, then just uh, referring to the performance highlights page of our report, which is page 18 of your report pack, it sets out our key successes and challenges during, during quarter four uh, and year to date. Um, I'll run through these performance highlights and then following that, happy to answer any questions to relate, relating to any area of the report. So bullet points one and two. Uh, during Q4, we've seen a slight increase in the number of accidental dwelling fires. However, overall, the yearly picture is good and below the three-year average. Because of the number of, of accidental dwelling fires dropping, this is having a positive impact on keeping the number of fire-related casualties low as well. And added to this fact that people in households are better prepared for fires in their home due to the extensive work that we are carrying out through our home safeties and our partnership working, which has been built up over the past few years, which we're keen to carry, carry forward. We're seeing a large number of increase in the home fire safety uh, referral pathways uh, from our partner agencies, allowing us to target those that are most vulnerable within our communities. At bullet point three, uh, we've only experienced one non-domestic fire during quarter four, which was at Strathmartin Hospital. Again, this is very low. This type of fire accounts for very low numbers within Angus. However, it's important due to the impact that it can have on our business community and our productivity. Our annual target for non-domestic fires is to keep them below 16. So a single figure increase is enough to change that performance from a positive to a negative one. However, keeping these numbers down is a priority for us and reducing the impact is also an important factor on this. Referring to bullet point four, we've highlighted the below average number of RTCs, road traffic collisions and related casualties again during quarter four. The spread of these is quite even across Angus. Sadly, there was one fatal casualty during quarter four, eh, which involved a road traffic collision at the Peter Den Junction. Um, involving a van and a bus. And we've also reported three non fatal casualties, which again is below the average. Whilst RTCs remain the biggest killer of 15 to 24 year olds in Scotland, we continue to try to change this. And going forward, I would also like to provide a little bit more context around other special services that we're increasingly, inv increasingly involved in surrounding priority three. In total, there were 69 special services in quarter four and nearly half were affecting entry, predominantly where there was concern for the occupier. We also acted at incidents where we acted as a first responder and attended flooding incidents. So going forward, we will be including some additional statistics around this in the report. At bullet point five, I've highlighted the unwanted fire alarm signals. I accounted for nearly one fifth of all incidents we attended. Over the past three years, we've been aiming to reduce this number five 5% year on year, which we're finding quite challenging because of external factors. For example, improvement in building regs and trends for more open plan buildings has led to an increase in fire detection, resulting in more chance of these activations. To enhance our stage one intervention on this type of incident of offering verbal advice to owners, we've recently created a leaflet through the directorate highlighting the cost of these incidents and offering further reduction strategies. We're very much focused on reducing these and working with premises uh, who do have persistent call outs. Referring to bullet point six, I've highlighted the ongoing challenges around reducing deliberate fires and the increase of these this year. On further investigation, we've not noticed any trends surrounding and the spread again is quite even across Angus area. Therefore, it isn't at the present given me great cause for concern as it's low numbers and it doesn't appear to be a significant problem across Angus. However, I will continually monitor it. The main attributor to the increase in numbers was a spate of summer 
fires around the Strathmartin area. Deliberate secondary fires are the lowest they have been for the past three years. And finally, a couple of other areas of the report to comment on. Uh, I would like the committee to note the work we're doing to ensure our crews are prepared for the role. We continue to visit and risk assess premises that are high risk and we've been involved in a number of high profile training events, such as uh, one with Tayside Sports Safety Team at Gayfield and Arbroath, and Exercise North Explorer through the Local Resilience Partnership. We've also employed an additional two support staff to assist in our rural areas in Angus, providing support to stations and carrying out further engagement with our partners to improve outcomes for the communities. And on page 32, appendix two, you'll also find information on a recent quarter four young firefighters course, which again is a great opportunity for us to assist the pupils within Angus to achieve, achieve their Prince's Trust Award. That, that covers the key highlights I wanted to report to the committee and happy to answer any questions, convener. Okay, uh, members, it's the usual procedure. I will ask you to indicate the pages you want to raise questions on. So if any of you who want to ask questions, use the raise hand button in the bottom right hand corner of the participants table and then we'll go through you individually and you can tell me what pages you want to speak on. First one I have is Councillor Devine. Page 20, 28 and 30. 28 and 30. Uh, better take a note of who that is, though. Right, uh, the next one I have is Councillor Boyd, Brian. It's a, it'll be a general question about the entire paper. Okay. Anyone else want to raise anything on this? So we only have Councillor Devine and Councillor Boyd. Right then, Councillor Devine, page 28. Thanks, convener. Uh, very briefly, I'm just delighted to see that Safe Angus is back. It is going to be back. That was a bit of a concern when that was stopped. So that, that's great. Then on page 30, um, I just really wanted to say, as we say so often actually, uh, it is so impressive the, the partnerships you have and the different organisations that you're speaking with and in particular in youth engagement. Um, that I noticed number two and number eight, there's CPR training going on in Carnoustie and Arbroath. And I know that you've done it in Brechin before. So I was wondering if the idea is to take this right across uh, Angus schools, both secondary and primary. Um, yeah, so thanks very much for the questions. Yes, so with the uh, CPR, this all originated through a partnership with the British Heart Foundation, where they provided us with some equipment uh, to carry out training for uh, members of the public. So as you say, we've, over the past few months and years, we've been going around schools and delivering this training and bringing people into local fire stations and going around other partners to deliver this type of training. Going forward, it's something that the service uh, seem to have adopted now, uh, on a regular basis, something that we will be carrying on going forward with uh, all our partners and members of the community, because obviously the more people that are trained in CPR, then obviously the better outcome for our communities are. Okay, uh, Councillor Boyd. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a, a general question. I'm, I'm noticing we're talking about quarter four of last year and the next report we're getting from the police will be first quarter of 2001. So my first question, that might be supplementary, uh, is... Can I just stop you there, Brian? Yep. You're speaking about the fire service or the police. You just said the next report from the police. Yes, it, it's into quarter so we're one. This, we're talking about the fire service at the moment. Yeah, well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say the question again. Why, what I'm trying to get across is why are we in quarter four for the fire service, I'm using the example that we're in quarter one for the police service report. I think that's a question for the next one. No, I'm wanting, I'm, I'm wanting to know why this one is, is why, why don't we have quarter one just now? Sorry, because so far. I haven't completed it yet. 
convener, I'm happy to come in and give a quick overview. Fine, thank you, uh, the, the, the current report uh, runs from the 1st of January to the end of March. That is our quarter four report. Uh, we are currently working uh, through our uh, quarter one uh, period, that's the 1st of April to the end of June. Once we get to the end of June, uh, it requires us a, a period of time to bring together all our stats and all our information to allow Scott to prepare the report. But uh, we'll make sure that uh, the quarter one report will be prepared and presented as quickly as we can. Great, that, that's fine. That was that was leading on to my therefore my next question. We had a serious fire, a serious fire in Carnoustie uh, in quarter one, and I, that's why I was trying, was hoping that we weren't going to jump from and miss a quarter because it's something that was uh, you know it was there was no fatalities and there was nothing like that, but there was there was a, there was um, you know it was a really really bad fire uh, in in a, in in a modern housing estate. Uh, and therefore, there is either there are two things here. One, I'd rather like to comment either yourself, Gordon, uh, or Scott, because there's some feedback I've gone uh, both positive and negative. Uh, so, uh, but maybe something out with the committee, I'd like to discuss uh, either with yourself or Scott uh, what what can be done so it's ready for the report as such. I no problem at all. Pick up with Scott and Gordon uh, outside the meeting, Brian. Yep. I mean, it's, uh, we'll get that report at the next meeting, probably. Cool. Okay, anybody else got anything on item four? Right then, we're asked to note item four. Do we note it? Agreed. Can I just ask uh, Gordon and Scott to hang on as normal until we deal with their partner service, the police, just in case no there's problem. anything that they've got to cross fertilize there. Can we move on to item 5A, which is the local policing area performance results for 1st of January to 31st of March. Can I ask Andrew Todd to speak to that? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, just before I introduce uh, the report, I just wanted to cover that the, our report also covers quarter four, so I'll have a conversation with Council Avoid at a later date just to provide any clarity that's required. But again, our, our report covers the um, last year and uh, up to the end of the financial year, the 31st of March 2020. As a consequence of that, it also reports against the old police plan, which was in existence at the time. That being said, of course, happy to take any questions on recent or relevant activity that's been ongoing in the area um, over the last couple of months that aren't covered in this report. And we will bring, obviously, a Q1 report at the relevant time to the next scrutiny meeting. So the report itself, I'll hand over to um, Chief Inspector Wayne Morrison for him to cover any salient points in there and then obviously take any questions uh, from that point. Thank you. OK, if we start, the general flavour of the report is to show the decrease in violence in Angus, particularly over the last two quarters, but a good uh, final quarter for Angus as well. If I move to page 38 on your document. <laughs> Total is 1,162 incidents of domestic abuse in Angus, which was an increase of 126 more than the previous year. At the end of the third quarter, we were 158 crimes more as a result of that increase. However, by the end of the year, we were only 105 more, so there was evidence in a, a decrease in the domestic incidents. 69 of these additional 105 crimes were the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act. Moving on, we're still on page 38, sexual crime. Overall, Group 2, we call it Group 2 crimes, apologies, offences were slightly up on last year. However, the increases were mainly from online offences, which were plus 17. Offences we refer to as other Group 2 offences, which were plus 36 crimes. Rape and sexual assault crimes were down for the year, and the detection rate, uh, rate for rape had increased by 10%. Safeguarding is page 41 in your document. Uh, again, like the third quarter, there was a significant decrease in the number of missing people reported, almost 50 per cent. We only had 69 for the final quarter. Uh, and the odds on how to explain that, it could be just the bad weather discouraging children from going out of their house and that, but a significant reduction. Look at the vulnerability calls, and had 500 calls the police dealt with in that final period, which was an increase of 3.4 per cent in comparison to the previous year. And it still remains the most significant demand on our officers' time. Moving to page 45, serious assaults. Uh, 
we had a poor start in Angus. I'll admit that the first half of the year we saw an increase in violence. But, uh, from the third quarter, uh, we can you continue to reduce the violence. And overall, at the end of the year, we had 12. Se we were 12 serious assaults under in comparison to the previous year, with a very similar detection rate to 86 percent. In the reporting period, January to the end of March, we had 14 crimes of serious assault recorded, 13 of which were detected. Location of seven of these offences were in licensed premises, with three being within a particular licensed premises in Arbroath. Moving on to page 46, common assault. Trend of reduction in petty assault started during the third quarter. At the end of September 2019, we were 68 crimes over in comparison to the previous year. The end of the year, there was an overall reduction of 30 crimes, which would have been more significant. But however, we had an increase in assaults on emergency workers of plus 19 crimes. And again, that's down to two or three incidents where individuals affected by alcohol or drugs just lashed out indiscriminately at times, generating five or six crimes of uh, assaults uh, on officers. Detection rates at the end of the year were up by three and a half percent. Quickly touching on antisocial behaviour on page 47. Uh, not much to say about that. There was a, a reduction of 20% of antisocial behaviour calls for the year in Angus, with vandalism also being done down by 4% and an increased detection rate of almost 5%. Moving on to page 50, robbery. Again, at the start of the year, the robbery seemed to spike. Uh, we started to drop back towards the end of the year. Uh, in the second half of the year, we showed a redu well, it reduced. Uh, ultimately, we were nine over halfway through the year. By the end of the year, we were just plus three. There were four robberies in the reporting period, three of which were detected. Drugs featured in all of the crimes. And the detection rate was significantly higher at 72.4%, which was 30% higher than last year. Housebreaking. Again, there was an increase in domestic housebreaking. It was plus 14 crimes for the year. However, looking at the crimes, a majority of these were poor attempts to gain entry into people's houses. The issues still remain around people uh, submitting false reports because they're requested to do so by the house and to get them a crime number to avoid them having to pay for any damage where they've tried to force their way into their own house after they lost their keys. It's difficult to disprove and also skews the figures a bit. The serious crime we take in Angus and most of our uh, housebreaking crimes will go to our community investigation unit and that's why the detection rate is almost double that for the previous year. Moving on to page 57, fraud. Significant increases in fraud, plus 63 crimes, which is, uh, we're seeing nationally. Uh, a vast majority of the crimes we'll, we'll identify after inquiry that the beneficiaries reside out with the Tayside area, and more often than not, it's outside Scotland, with a lot being down in England or further afield, Eastern Europe. Major increases in online fraud and scams. You, you'll probably have seen the social media now. A number of the, the crimes just now are asking people to purchase vouchers, predominantly Amazon, and then provide the codes as a form of payment. We've tried to educate all the supermarkets in Angus. We have a good relationship with the supermarket managers, you know, and we're trying to get across. If somebody comes in and asks to purchase £700 worth of Amazon vouchers, chances are they're going to be a victim of fraud. And we are getting a really good response from the supermarkets. However, two or three still fall through the loop, and we've seen people lose three and four figure sums this quarter, unfortunately. Moving on to page 64, road safety. Scott from Fire and Rescue touched upon it. One fatality on the A90 at Petter Den, unfortunately. Overall, across the division, uh, fatalities reduced from 18 to 13 on the road. So a positive result there. Page 66, speeding. We've talked about that in the last two or three scrutinies. An increase of 36.1% in comparison to the previous year, with a total of 1,560 speeding offences, which was over 400 more offences than last year. And finally, for me, page 67, the drink and drug driving offences, an increase of 54.7% up to 147. Obviously, the roadside drug testing kits are impacting on that. I'm speaking to our inspector from our road policing unit, they're stopping around 100 vehicles a day easily in Tayside. It might just be increased proactivity as well. We're catching more and more, but I think the drug testing kits is significant in that uh, rise. And that is me. Thank you. I've got five hands up for questions. Uh, we'll start off with Councillor Bell. Do you want a list of my page I want numbers? Your pages. Okay, so 38, 60, 63, and 71. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Devine. Page 46, 47, 
59 and 63. Uh, Councillor Miles. Yes, it's general, but uh, mainly concerned page 39, 42 and 51. 39, 42, 42 and 51. And a general. Okay, Councillor Laurie. Page 63. Okay. And Councillor Whiteside. Page 64 and 66. Right then. We we'll start with Councillor Bell on page 38. Thanks very much and uh, thank you uh, Andrew and, and Wayne. Obviously the domestic abuse figures are hugely concerning um, and I know at the start of lockdown Angus Women's Aid was uh, getting a sense that there would be a, a dip in uh, reports uh, of domestic abuse because people didn't feel safe to, to use the phone or computer at home. Um, and I wondered if, uh, anecdotally, you were aware of any increase or any issues uh, since the start of lockdown um, that are emerging around that. Um, and obviously we're seeing the, the daily sit reps around uh, child protection issues, but I'm, I'm, I'm quite concerned about women and families um, being stuck in these situations. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Um, it's Andrew Todd, so I'll take that, that question. That was a, um, a concern that we all held within the public protection arena about the uncited uh, risk that would present. We did see a drop off in all activity relating to um, the police, not just in the public protection, but just in general terms uh, across everything that we were dealing with. What we have seen is a, is a, is a recovery back to more normal levels. And as it sits just now, we're experiencing um, more normal levels of reporting and adult concern reports being, being submitted. What we did do at the start, respe respecting the, um, the, the risk of what we were dealing with, was that we maintained our full range of capability within the public protection arena, regardless of the drop-off in volume. We maintained that capability rather than reallocating it into more important matters, particularly when we were dealing with such significant absence at the early part of the COVID-19 uh, situation. What we've also done through our C3 colleagues is put in place a mechanism where there's a, a safe call system where you can just text the police and text details through, which uh, I'm advised has had some success um, there as well. But certainly from an anecdotal um, point, we're not seeing a backlog of inquiries coming through over the last eight or ten weeks. Um, so uh, the, the specific picture Time will tell whether or not there's a backlog to come through to us. We all know that a victim of domestic abuse won't phone us on the first occasion, and when we do get that report from, from the victim, we often find there's a catalogue of, of inquiry behind and, and uh, circumstances which um, the victim has been subject to over a long period of time. So we don't know, is, is the honest answer, whether or not we've missed um, anything within homes where people have been unable to contact us. But what we can say with reassurance is we've maintained our full capability, we've enhanced the options available to victims to contact us, and we've been alert to that risk, not just as a service, but across our partners um, and local authority as well as third sector. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it gives me comfort that you're kind of on the case, but, I, you know, it's about being prepared for that um, third, um, as, as we may well experience. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Okay, Councillor Miles, page 39. Yes, uh, th this pertains to, to more than just page 39 of the report. It's on the detection rates. Uh, I would just like to say well done for bucking the Scottish trend and, and improving your detection rates. It's very welcome to see. And especially in page 51, uh, almost doubling of the robbery detection rates in Angus. But, that was from a pretty low start last year, but you may be caught up in where you, uh, some of the ones last year. And uh, wh while I'm on, the, the general comment that's uh, touched on in page 42 is uh, the new uh, different regulations and compliance you have to do now with this COVID uh, uh, restriction, social distancing. It must be increasingly difficult for you guys to keep uh, your kind of social distance in uh, this instance. And the question is, uh, do you get tested on a regular basis? 
Uh, is NHS providing that for you, or do, would you wish that? No, we, we we are able. Everybody that meets the criteria, we are able to have tested um, and bring them back onto the front line. Our positive rate is incredibly low uh, as a division, but we have had a number of officers tested, um, which I don't have the figures to hand. But what I can assure um, all members is that anybody that meets the, the criteria set by the scientists is being tested within the time scale required. We've got no ask in that area at all. Well done. Okay. Right, can we go to Lynn Devine, please, page 46. 46, yes, thank you, convener. Um, that's really heartening to hear, Andrew, actually, uh, about the testing. Uh, but it's also heartening to see the decrease in, in common assaults and violence. Um, I was just wondering if you could give me a little bit more information about the Mentors in Violence programme. One, are you involved with it? Are the police involved with it? Um, I know that it's certainly happening in Forfar Academy. I was just wondering if um, all secondary schools are doing it. And um, seeing as it's a really proactive and preventive um, scheme, a measure, I was wondering if it's going to be taken into primaries, maybe primary six, seven. Hi, Alan, it's uh, Wayne here. Hi. Uh, Yes, minors and violence. Yes, it's throughout Angus. At the minute, we have a couple of community officers that have actually done the, the, the training course, so they're able to train the community officers as well. As it stands, the only two schools that we don't have it in just now are Monifeath and Carnoustie, and that was due to COVID coming in, and obviously the community officers not getting in and about the, the schools. Uh, it's something we think is of real value. Uh, it's uh, on some of our tasking documents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We see the value of educating the kids about the, the issues around violence. As for your question about primary schools, mm, I'm not too sure P6, P7 is ready for that. There, there probably are some other ones, but we, we find that we get our best results when we take it to the secondary schools, to be honest. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Just carry on to page 47, please, Lynn. Uh, yeah, it, I just wondered if there was a typo here in outcome to antisocial behaviour. We we're talking about the three tiered uh, process. Um, we've got tier one, where the intervention is the remit of the housing provider, and then it jumps to tier three. Is that tier two? And if not, where does tier two come in? Tier two is very similar. That's, I think I explained it the last time. Tier two is sort of your your middle of the range type thing in tier three we probably say three or four calls are there but depending on everything <laughs> so tier two isn't a typo we've not missed it out it just it seems to be tier one or tier three is the, the ones we most commonly use okay yeah i thought i thought i'd said something about that before but anyway thank you okay um still with you lynn page 59 mm -hmm. Yeah it's, uh, yeah, it's heartening to see that uh, drug, the possession of drugs in Angus has gone down. Um, I was wondering if you think you've got the balance right between uh, the possession, uh, tackling the possession and tackling the supply of drugs. Um, I, I think... I think more is supposed to be on the supply than the possession, but uh, maybe you could see that please as wrong. Yeah, so what, what I would reassure, so it's Andrew here, so what I would reassure members is that um, when we um, address our role within the overarching public health space of, of drugs, um, my position is that we will relentlessly pursue those who profit from the sale and supply of controlled drugs, and we will identify and support the vulnerability that we uncover during that process. And now, the, the, underneath that, what will clearly happen is that we'll perhaps target somebody for supply, but they'll only be in, in, a, in possession of drugs, and we report them for that. We didn't, we didn't uh, go with the intention of that. Um, but the definition of a supply and a possession charge is sometimes just a moot point. What we won't do, though, is ignore the vulnerabilities. So if there's young children in the house or there's mental health or there are other issues, we refer those through to partners. 
with a view to trying to break that cycle rather than just enforce our way out of that wider problem. So I, I would look at the overall um, activity within that space and the overall number and try not to differentiate to too great an extent between supply and possession because often there's only you know, one, or small, one or two small points of difference between them. Um, but just be, be reassured that we're not just out stopping people for possession for no purpose. Um, we will provide and support um, where we can the vulnerability that we identify in that process. Okay, and the next one is Councillor Bell on page 60. Okay, thank you. Um, given that it's a quarter four report under the um, drug misuse supply of drugs section on page 60, I was quite surprised there was no mention of the county lines issues, um, which were obviously very prominent over the last year or so. But um, so I, I would like to find out a bit more about that. H have those lines been closed off? I would imagine that in quarter one, that lockdown would have had a massive impact on that anyway. So anything you've got on that would be useful. I will... C C county lines is an overused term. Um, if I can be as bold as that, it, it refers to a specific methodology used by um, some drug dealers and the importation of drugs into our area on the road and rail network has been going on for generations and has continued to go on during the lockdown period um, w with greater or lesser um, success by the drug dealers. So I think it's a, it's a term that's overused and misunderstood because many people view it as it means that drugs are being imported from England or from other parts of Scotland or from abroad. That's always been the case. Uh, we, don't, we don't manufacture our own drugs um, per se within the Angus area, so they've always been imported in. What we have found, though, is that we're finding more vulnerability around drugs and that some people are being exploited as a consequence of that. But again, that's not unusual where people who use drugs sell drugs to fund their habit. Um, and so that's not an unusual situation as well. So it's a term and that I'm trying to back away from because I don't think it adds any value to the conversation. Um, what I can assure you is that we're doing all we can to stop the bringing of drugs into our area using national resource, roads policing resource, as well as local resource. And then when it is here, making sure that we target those that are, that are profiting from the sale and supply. Okay. The ball remains with you, Julie, page 63. Okay, thanks, Karina. Um, yeah, I wanted to pick up on outcome three, the hate crimes, and I, I, I wanted to start by reflecting that it's four years to the day that Joe Cox MP was murdered by a, a right-wing um, extremist. Uh, and obviously uh, racism and hate crimes are, are high on the agenda just now um, and I really feel that if Angus thinks that it doesn't happen in our communities we're sadly deluded um, so I would be really interested in seeing some figures um, on a rolling basis uh, there, there aren't any stats uh, in, our, in our papers nor in the last report um, and it, it's really the best see those emerge and I really would be interested to know what what in this division are planning and doing as part of a national programme to really encourage people to experience hate crime to come forward. I would like to know if the HIMAP group will involve people from our uh, BAME communities and also my page 71 query, so hopefully the convener doesn't mind if I wrap it up together. What data is emerging from the contest and prevent work um, around interventions uh, and the, the demographics that are identified as at risk? And that's me. Thank you. Do you get all that, Andrew? I, I, I did. Makes perfect sense. So thank you, Councillor Bell. And thank you, Chair, for clarifying. Um, the, the challenge we have around our hate figures, and the, the, the ask is entirely appropriate, and we will do our level best to bring it back in some format, is that often there are crimes um, which, are, which are substantive on their own. So we'll use the example of an assault. 
It's, a, it's a crime of assault, but it's motivated by hatred, um, be that race or any other protected characteristic. So we refer to it as a hate crime, but it's not a standalone entity in its own right. Police Scotland still operates a multitude of different crime recording systems. Now, we are working on that, but therein lies the outcome of capital investment has left us where we are just now. So depending upon where you are in the country, it's recorded differently um, or, or recorded differently, but not um, assessed or defined differently. So it's the same definition across the country, but some people will record it in some systems, some people record it in other systems. So the organisation has a real challenge around that. And I know the HMICS has looked at that point as well. But nonetheless, we know on a daily basis what crimes we have, which are either substantive hate crimes in their own right or crimes otherwise motivated by, by hatred. And certainly the area commander reviews those on a daily basis um, to make sure that they are given the priority that they deserve because we fully respect the impact they have upon communities. There are no main themes right across Tayside, not just with an Angus, um, that emerge from those reviews that we keep, we, we keep on um, um, top of every day. But what we can do is we will pull something together and present that to next committee and see if it meets the, um, the, the desires of committee to actually absolutely look into this space, um, given the profile right now, and, uh, and also to allow me to get some feedback from you as to our performance in that area. In regards to the high map, I'll, I'll ask Wayne to come in in a minute just to, to speak about any understanding he has of, of that question um, and our response around it. And in regards to the contest to prevent, I will need to take that away and come back off table in regards to any themes that may be emerging from there. I'm certainly not advised of any themes that emerge from there. Um, it, it's a very worthwhile, well attended and well um, embedded process that we have, but there are no themes so far that have emerged out from there that I would bring to this table, but I will see if there's any that are emerging going forward and uh, report back. So if Wayne's got anything on, on the high map, the high map thing, we've tried to get that off the ground for the last two or three years. We were looking to try and get a Tayside one. There was a bit of pushback from Perth and Canross, I believe, but it's taken forward by a prevention inspector who's uh, obviously working. And you see the benefit of a Tayside uh, one across the whole of the, the region rather than just a local one. You can pull the resources and get a better understanding of everything that's going. Again, I, I'll have to come back to you on where we are with that because it's out with my remit to disorder, but it's something we've been pushing for two or three years since I come uh, back through to Dundee and the partnership post, but again, there's been a lot of talk, but I've still got to see what's uh, generated from it. But if I can give Council just a reassurance of a, of a figure, so, so the actual substantive crime of racially aggravated harassment and conduct last year for the, for the reporting period talking about was 24 crimes um, recorded in Angus. So it's not, it's not a, these are 24 unacceptable crimes that are treated at the highest priority um, for us and make sure we get the right support into um, the victims and, and the victims' communities. But we don't see a, a huge substantive problem and certainly no themes emerging from that. Um, but that's not to diminish it in any way, so I wouldn't want to be misunderstood. But it was just to give uh, members some understanding of the figures we're discussing. Well, thank you, but I mean, I, I, I really feel that the time for action is now, and if, if there has been resistance, um, you know, that shouldn't hinder everybody else from <coughs> taking forward. Um, and if, if it's 24 crimes in Angus, that to me suggests that there's a big iceberg that hasn't emerged yet, and that gives me concern. I really want people in Angus and across Tasty feel um, able to report things when they, when they happen and actually for a wider education programme um, to reduce the likelihood of any hate crimes. You're breaking up quite a bit. Uh, I'm going to ask the police again, did they get what you were saying? Yeah, no, I totally understand and I take away the action uh, for us to review and consider a uh, high map within the Angus area. Thank you. Uh, right, Councillor Devine, you're on page 63 as well. Yes, it's just a very small question really. It's about the keep, keep safe locations. And obviously, unfortunately, a lot of these places will have been closed um, over the last three months. But um, 
I wondered if it would be helpful for councillors to have a list of where these places are in our own wards, because we come across people um, who might well be a bit afraid and, and we could tell them where they could go for, for help if necessary when they're out in the town. Would that be possible? Yep, don't see a problem with that at all. We'll just take that under advice, um, make sure we're not compromising any agreements we've got with those locations. Um, and uh, assuming there's no issues with that, I'll ask Wayne to circulate that through um, committee. Can I ask you, Andrew, on that one, that uh, if you manage to do that for each ward, remember that our growth is two wards together. We operate as a, a, as a cooperative rather than as individual wards to these sort of things. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ben, sorry to keep you waiting so long. All right, convener, thanks. Um, my questions are also around hate crimes. Um, a recent report published by the Crown Office shows that incidents of hate crime are increasing in Scotland. Among these, racism is still the most commonly reported crime, with over 3,000 charges brought in Scotland in the last year alone, a rise of 4% on the previous year. So my first question, and I appreciate that some of this will have been covered by Councillor Bell's question, is are we seeing this national trend reflected in Angus? And my second question is two parts. What advice would you give to anybody who becomes the target of a hate crime while out and about? And secondly, what advice would you give to anyone who witnesses a hate crime uh, taking place in public? I'll take a second point first, if I may. I mean, discrimination in any form is, is unacceptable. And uh, uh, that which we accept, we endorse, I believe is a well-used phrase. So I don't think anybody should accept um, the witness or witnessing a, a hate crime occurring. Um, whether or not somebody chooses to intervene, um, chooses to report it, um, or chooses to, do, to take some other action, um, is, a, is a matter for them to make an assessment at the time. Sometimes just a small intervention is all that's required, um, particularly when there's youths involved and, uh, and a wee bit of that pastoral leadership that folk in our community can provide. But that's different to perhaps um, seeing an act of violence being perpetrated, then I think the best thing to do would be phoning us straight away on 999. Um, my assessment is that along with a number of other crimes, hate crime will be underreported. Uh, and so an increase in itself shouldn't necessarily be viewed as a bad thing at this stage if we assume that it's an underreported crime. So for me, the, the figures aren't um, the be all and end all of how we are measuring our success in this space. It's more about the confidence of the public, the confidence of the victims to come forward and know that they'll be treated with respect and dignity. Their, their complaint will be treated um, at, at the appropriate level of authority and priority. Um, and that we will do our level best to gather the evidence to substantiate a crime and report it to Crown for further consideration. So I would fully expect um, members, I fully support uh, people who are victims of hate crime. And a hate crime is just a crime that they perceive to be motivated wholly and partly by a protected characteristic. So uh, for me, they should be reporting it through. I would encourage them to do that and I would encourage people to have the confidence and faith in us to carry that forward um, in a way that's dignified and respectful of any demand on them as a consequence of reporting it. Um, in regards to the actual figures in um, uh, Angus, I'll just ask Wayne to give an overview of how the year went for him in regards to the reviews that he does regularly. Um, Wayne? Yeah, as Mr Todd explained, there's, a, there's hate crimes and there's hate incidents. So both hate crime and hate incidents were slightly below recorded for that for 2019 and we're probably talking hate incidents round about if I remember correctly 60 or so which I think was seven or eight incidents less than last year uh, as I say you've requested some of the figures but we could be much more accurate with that but uh, my understanding at the end of the year was we were slightly under where we were this time last year okay all right uh, side, page 64 Thanks, Convener. Um, I just wanted to touch on the road safety fatality. Um, we Scotland will be well aware that the local community council at Teeling have had um, this item on their agenda for years now, the safety around the junctions. And it's not just the Petterden Junction, it's the Inveraldi, Teeling, Morrows and Newbiggin Junctions, all in that vicinity. 
Um, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning it again this time is I was actually at a Teal and Community Council meeting the night before this accident happened and they were expressing their disappointment about the um, so-called improvements that have been made by Bear Scotland. Now they've been consulting with Bear Scotland um, over the years to try and get some improvements made. They were raising concerns that the visibility that some of the new barriers, um, barriers had decreased visibility rather than increased visibility. So when I woke up the next morning and heard about the, the incident, it, it was quite shocking. And I just wondered if Police Scotland have any view about those junctions and whether there still needs to be work done to improve the safety. Um, thank you, Councillor. Um, this is a difficult one for us as a service um, because our role um, as, as a partnership is complete through the education, the engineering and the enforcement uh, methodology that's well proven within the road safety sector. The difficulty is that we're better at the enforcement than we are at the engineering. Um, we are police officers. What I can reassure is that after every accident, a fatal accident, there's a site visit um, that's conducted and lessons learnt as quickly as possible. And so we will share the circumstances as we found them at that accident uh, or collision with the engineering teams and uh, with others within local authority where appropriate to understand whether or not any mitigating measures need to be taken at that time or considered going forward if it forms part of a pattern. And then obviously once we've completed our entire inquiries and, and um, reflected the matter to the Crown, then that might result in further works being done for an area. But it wouldn't be appropriate for us to second guess an engineering conclusion based upon our view as police officers uh, and untrained engineers. And you had page 66 as well, Councillor Whiteside. Yeah, just a, a quick one, and I think Wayne touched on this um, earlier. Um, I was just going to ask if the increase in drink and drug offences, do they feel it's a real increase or just a result of the increased testing, particularly the drug wipe testing? The, the drug wipe testing undoubtedly plays into this because it didn't, at this point last year we didn't have it. It came in part way through the year. So we're rapidly trying to understand exactly where we sit in regards to our drink and drug driving and I've asked for figures to be separated out for Q1 of next year because I think that could show an even starker um, period because our Q1 of 2019-20 didn't have that charge at all or that capability for us at all compared to this year. So we could see quite a marked jump and I need to understand and explain to yourselves what that means and, and whether or not that's a good or a bad story. Um, and then, of course, there's obviously the other element of, well, from those um, crimes that we're recording, how many are we detecting? Because we've always assumed that a drink drive uh, charge is a detected charge from the outset, because you can't, be not, you can't have an unproven drink drive. You either are under the influence and reported or you're not. So it's not a crime. So you can't have an undetected drink drive crime. You can have an undetected drug crime because it takes time to analyse the figures. So we're, we're doing a lot of work just now as we're seeing this play out, but undoubtedly they're being influenced by our improved capability in that space. Okay, we managed to find out where the fire alarm was. Okay, um, are, we, are we finished on that one? Have we, still, have, have we still got Police Scotland? Yes, we're still here. We think it's a, there's a test. <laughs> there's a test, right. <laughs> oh, you're all right. Okay. Um, Not good for us wearing earphones. <laughs> have you got an answer on that one, Andrew? No, that, that's me covered that. I mean, I, I know that wasn't a very comprehensive answer, but the, the reality is we, we know that we've got more to bring at the end of Q1 around the drink and drug driving, and we know that it's being heavily influenced by our improved capability through the drug wipes that our roads policing teams have um, and, and what it is that they are now recording. Um, and we know it follows from, as Wayne said, significant amount of activity by our roads policing teams. And it's only those officers that have got access to these wipes at this time, um, but they, they are doing a significant amount of work. So if members would bear with me, um, and at Q1, they should expect to see um, a, a better rationale and understanding of what, that, um, the, what those figures actually mean. Thank you, Andrew. Um, right, um, as far as I understand, you covered page 71 in your last submission, Councillor Bell. 
Yes, thank you, convener. Right. Is there any more questions on uh, the police report? If not, can we note it, please? Okay. Okay. Right, again, uh, pass over to you, Andrew, uh, the local policing plan. I know we had a big presentation about this at the last um, meeting, and I think this is just for us to note and accept it. Is that correct? Yep, Chair, that's correct. Thank you. Right then, I hope everybody's read through it. We had the presentation at the last meeting. We asked to note this uh, plan and implementation. Not agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Well, thank you very much to the police and the fire service. Uh, we'll let you go now and get back to your day job, and uh, we'll then move on to the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. We will come to the um, Angus Alive Anthem report. So I ask Kirsty Hunter to introduce us, please. Thank you, convener, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to your um, virtual scrutiny and audit meeting to um, present the Angus Alive annual report for 2018-19. The director's report and consolidated financial statements for the period ended the 31st of March 2019 were actually lodged with Companies House on the 21st of November 2019 and were also filed with Oscar, the charity regulator, prior to the end of that calendar year. The corporate annual report, um, which was shared with you as well as a link um, and a PDF document, was published on our website on the 3rd of February of this year um, and was also scheduled to come to an earlier meeting um, of this group, which had to be cancelled as a result of the current public health emergency, so hence the delay in it getting to you. I'm delighted to confirm that as a result of the hard work across the team, and also to their dedication to the people of Angus, that the charity was able to achieve a net income of £415,000 during the financial year 1819. And I can advise that um, following the conclusion of that year, an, an agreement by the board of directors that those funds have been added as a contribution to our reserves. The net income that was achieved is really, really important um, because it helps us to ensure that we can maintain our facilities and the standard of our equipment and the services that we offer to encourage people to come to participate in all the free activities that we offer, but also in those that we charge for to help with income generation. I'd also like to highlight that the net income was achieved while also making sure that we successfully um, delivered the required savings that's been agreed with Angus Council within a three-year plan for savings um, over 17, 18, 18, 19 and 19, 20. The Culture, Sport and Leisure Trust welcomed over 2.8 million visitors in the year within the report. There was an increase in visitors to our libraries, our theatre and also within Countryside Adventure with decreases in sports centres and our museums, galleries and archives. But overall, the numbers balanced out to the, the same sort of levels as the year prior. You'll note on page 11 that we've included a new table that outlines our contribution to the community plan. And that's something that we have um, added in collaboration with colleagues in the council to ensure that we're able to highlight that. And we'll be looking to further develop that in years to come. Our key achievements and developments are detailed by strategic aim and also through a series of different case studies. And there's a few of those that I just wanted to highlight for you in particular. First of all, I'm absolutely delighted to confirm that all five of our museums were awarded full accreditation by Museums Gallery Scotland. And that was something that's really important, both in terms of the standard of the service that's being delivered but also with regards to ensuring that we're able to access funds, which you can only secure if you are an accredited museum. We've subsequently gone on in the um, most recent year, 1920, to make use of that particular accreditation to achieve funds towards the developments at the Signal Tower Museum that have been completed now in our growth. I also wanted to highlight that we achieved a level five, um, which is the highest level that's ever been awarded, um, they never award a level six seemingly, 
um, for the How Good Is Our Public Library Service, or Higgyopples, um, as it's commonly referred to. And that was for Quality Indicator 3, which is for learning culture. And our peer review in that area particularly commented on the feedback from participants who take part in a variety of different learning activities across the library estate and also within community settings. It's also with the support of Angus Council and the hard work of colleagues in property and across other areas of the organisation that we were able to complete a refurbishment of Montrose Library and the new edition opened there within 1819 as well. The Move More partnership with Macmillan um, was signed within 2018-19 and that's on page 31 of the report but I'm delighted to confirm that in the past year that's then gone on not only to be something that we've signed but we've also started to deliver on and to support those affected by cancer and beyond cancer within our communities. And we also welcomed our sixth community sport hub which has been really important in helping to ensure that we can support community organisations, clubs and teams to deliver support um, within Angus. We were already operating, um, as many of our counterparts are across the country, in an increasingly challenging environment with increased competition in terms of offering and also price point for services, but also the fact that um, most of the services that we offer, which are um, the income generating ones, are actually items that people can choose to spend their discretionary spend on or obviously um, choose to go elsewhere or potentially don't have the discretionary spend at the same levels as before. Now that we've gone into the current um, pandemic situation, that's obviously going to be changing that situation ever more for the future. But it was just to highlight that that was already a challenge within the year that we're reviewing here. I also just wanted to take the opportunity to highlight that we're working with our external auditors, Scott Mancreef, to ensure that we can, despite the challenges of working remotely as we are all having to do at the moment, to ensure that we can continue to work towards achieving a September sign-off of the annual accounts in September for 1920. And that's something that over um, the last three years we've been moving that forward every year. And apologies, that's the fish fan arriving from our bros. <laughs> So, um, that, yeah, I was going to conclude at that point and open up any <laughs> questions. Thank you. Fine. Uh, bids for questions. I have Councillor MacDonald. Uh, page 95 and then just throughout the report as well as 131132133. Okay, uh, Councillor Whiteside. Page 143. Uh, Councillor Miles. A general comment. Councillor Boyd? Uh, it's page 101 of, the, of our papers and a uh, general comment on theatres at the end. All right. Um, okay. Can we start off with Councillor MacDonald on page 95? Yep, sure. Kirsty, I hope we're not stopping you getting some haddock um, <laughs> by the meeting running on. Um, yeah, it's a general sort of point we, we brought up last year about, and this is not really a point for maybe. Um, Firstly, but the, the committee in general, um, the time that we received this report, 2018-19, uh, I'm not sure fits in with um, the background at 3.1 where it says the committee has remit to review the governance and assurance arrangements for significant partnerships. I think it's really difficult as councillors to review um, something that's so far back because the questions that I'm going to be put into Angus Alive will maybe be being dealt with already or we'll be repeating ourselves. You know, there's, there's just a thing of like, why is this coming to this committee in this format? And is there a different way that we can do it? And maybe I've got our relationship wrong and this is right, but I just wonder if there's ways we can look at how we look at Angus Alive and maybe review it in a, a more timely way. Um, I'm not sure if, that, if that's something that, that the committee can do, because I know we brought up last year and it's all to do when the finances go in and all of that. Um, I think the report's excellent. I think it's quite clear from the report that the core priorities and the strategic, strategic aims that are they're really well um, articulated in the report. And I think um, some, of, some of the things I think Kirsty highlighted, um, especially about the museums, and it's a unique little gem that we've got such great sort of uh, places to go and visit in our communities. Um, 
we highlighted some of the the the, the figures on the, the membership and, and the, the attendances. I went back to the previous report and this comes back to my sort of first point. It would be useful, I think, for us as a committee to, to be able to see comparators in one report. So, for example, library attendance is up an astonishing 26,000, which is great. I mean, that's, that's phenomenal. Um, however, you mentioned the Be Active membership, which is down 580 on the previous report. So obviously that would be a concern. I know no competition with smaller gyms is, is um, big, but we don't have many of the bigger gyms in Angus to compete as well. I mean, sports centre attendance is down 136,906 people uh, visits, um, yep. which is huge. Um, of course, it could be tied in with that 580 people that, that didn't take it up. So really what I'm kind of getting at, uh, convener, I've covered all of my page numbers in the one point. I'd noticed that. <laughs> um, but it, it's really looking at, um, yeah, what are we doing as the Scrutiny and Audit Committee with this report and the time that we get it, because it's about a year and a bit after we, it's relevant. Um, it's looking at the statistics and how we can, as a committee, look at them um, and be able to compare and contrast with what's gone before. And, so we can make that sort of, um, you know, how we can get the assurance arrangements and look at them and make sure things are right. And I'm just wondering about the organisational review that you mentioned. Um, it'll be coming to its end this year, um, I think, or is it 2020. How far are we on with that? And sort of, is there anything you can tell us about what that, um, that sort of is, is finished with or entailed? Yeah. So I can address each of those points individually, councillor. So in terms of the timing of the report, um, last year the accounts were filed, um, as I mentioned in the opening statement, to Companies House on the 21st of November. And then we published the, this report at the start of February. I would have hoped to normally have had even this report out slightly earlier, but we had had a change in personnel within our marketing department. Um, so this year, I've mentioned that we're looking for a sign off um, by the board in September and that's each year we're working with finance colleagues and the external auditors to bring that forward so that it helps um, in terms of the council's group accounts and um, so what I would be um, looking to do this year is also to have the corporate version so the kind of you know the glossy nice one that's easier to understand and um, ready by the end of the calendar year so that would bring it certainly significantly forward and um, so i don't know if that would help towards um the first question there in terms of the um comparators then we can look to include that absolutely that's not a problem at all so i can speak to the team who are currently developing the report for 1920 so we can look to make sure that that's included in future years for you and um thanks for the, the positive comments as well around the the way that it's presented um, overall. With regards to the organisational review, we have concluded the vast majority of the organisational review um, and we are at the moment, given the current situation in a kind of pause phase because of the pandemic, there's three areas um, that we were still looking to review. Um, those include the theatre, the um, senior leadership team and also um, the coaching review. So at the moment, with the public health emergency, we're currently on a pause with that, but the other areas of the organisation have been delivered. Thank you. Councillor uh, Whiteside, page 143. Thanks, convener. Um, I just picked up on the, the board of directors and um, sadly in line with many organisations, it seems to me that it's not very representative of the people of Angus and its makeup. Um, it would be great to have a little bit more uh, diversity, certainly a bit more gender balance and maybe a wider age of age, ages. So I just wondered if there's any strategy in place um, as and when the directors um, step down from the board to try and improve that balance going forward. I'd also like to say that I, I totally agree with what um, Mark said and I wondered if, if it would be um, useful for the scrutiny and audit committee to see a draft report rather than wait until everything is finalised um, at this late stage. So in terms of the diversity of the board of directors, um, 
would absolutely agree with you. We have got a statement on our call for independent directors, which re-emphasizes and makes it really clear front and center that Angus Live welcomes applications from all and appoints on the basis of merit and that we're committed to promoting diversity throughout our organization. Um, in terms of the directors, those are obviously made up of two types of directors. So we have council appointed directors, which equates to four directors and independent directors, which equates to five um, directors currently. So it's obviously important to ensure that in terms of representation of the wider community of Angus, that with regards to the directors that are put forward from both those areas, um, that there is representation. Um, that helps to ensure that we can be representative of the people of Angus. Obviously, it also depends with regards to the independent directors on who it is that puts themselves forward um, to be considered um, and to go through that process. Thanks. I, I should have also said, um, is there any form of self-assessment for the directors uh, or are they appointed for a fixed term or is there any um, self-assessment as far as uh, attendance boards and um, participation so in terms of the um if i miss any of those bits then please do call me out for it um so in terms of the director's performance there's a um annual um performance that's now conducted by the directors so that they can review how that's going and um also the performance of the chair and also then discuss um, whether there's any changes that need to be made to that and we've now got a company secretary who is appointed, who is from um, Thornton's legal firm, um, and they're now involved in that process as well as the company secretary to ensure that there's some independence within that. Um, can you remind me, sorry, of the other two parts that you asked? Um, just a, a question around whether, um, if there was any of the board members not attending meetings, etc., or not actually being involved, uh, would there be any review of, of how long the appointment would go on for. So I think that that's something that would need to be addressed by the chairperson and by fellow board directors, not as myself as chief executive, um, but certainly there's a code of conduct for um, directors in the same way as there is for councillors. So um, it would be up to them in partnership with the um, company secretary to look at any non-attendance. Thanks. I could just come in there, Kirsty. If you care to have a look at, I think it's report 15, um, you'll find that the attendance of members of the Scrutiny and Audit Committee is listed uh, in that report. We scrutinised to that extent that how many meetings was there and how many did we attend. So it's maybe uh, something to look at. Okay. okay. Uh, can I ask uh, Councillor Boyd to come in on page one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I was uh, page 101 of, uh, and I think it's the, the chairman's report, six paragraphs before the bottom of the page, where um, he says our sports development team now supports a total of six community sports hubs based in Arbroath, Carnoustie, oh sorry, it doesn't, it doesn't, that, that's, that's what I'm getting to, Carnoustie should have been in there, uh, Arbroath, Brecon, Kerry, Muir, Montrose and Monifeet, along with its new addition in Forfar, which opened in October 2018. You must agree that I, I, I find that uh, very disappointing since actually Carnoustie is the one that brings millions and millions of pounds in versus sports type of things and brings millions into the local economy by the golf that was in the open that actually was here on the same year when the, there was a new addition to Forfar. So my question is when will Carnoustie be part of this uh, community sports hub initiative? I would need to go and speak to the Community Sport Hub team and get back to you on that one because that's not a specific point that I would have an answer for right here, but I can certainly take that away and get the team to get back to you, Councillor Boyd. Well, that, that would be lovely. You know, it is disappointing. We have a 47-year-old a swimming pool in the town. We seem to be bottom the pile time and time again. And But let's hope we can move forward and get some encouragement, be part of this, and actually bring some fairness throughout and, and get a swimming pool in Carnoustie. Thank you. What I can maybe also highlight at that point with regards to community sports hubs is that as part of the organisational review, we now have two people within that area um, and continue to receive um, support from Sports Scotland towards the funding of one of those two posts.
Have we lost the, have we lost the convener? He's on mute. It's been muted. Yes, that's better. I'm sorry about that. Somebody tried to phone me and uh, that cut my connection just for a bit. Right, okay. Where are we now? We've completed uh, Councillor Boyd, have we? Unless you want me to do my theatre bit as well or you want to come back uh, to that? Just do the theatre no, bit no. as well, yes. <laughs> well, um, oh, this is on a more lighter note that uh, uh, I did notice the figures were great for theatres. Uh, as everybody knows, I'm a great theatre buff. The, 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 the show must go on. <laughs> But it does lead on to a, uh, it does lead on to uh, a, 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 you know, something that is worrying. Naturally, under uh, Angus Alive, it had professional shows that were coming. Uh, so the professional side of things, we're going to see a revenue drop in that. And then something that's more important to my heart is, of course, is the amateur clubs uh, with Kerry and Forfar, and uh, you know, there is there's one in there, there are one in most of the boroughs. Most of them fall under Angus Alive, and because the, the theatres are there. I think it's only Canusti because it's 47 year old theatre is in part of the school and I think Brecon set up uh, the wonderful uh, City Hall and still do their shows in there. But the rest of them do fall under, under Angus Alive. Uh, so um, I know I'm putting you on the spot here, but what will happen, I suppose it, what does happen is it depends on how things go on uh, and when, when we'll be able to um, um, get back into some form of normality but then of course also the revenues coming in from both professional shows at the Webster and uh, and something for the amateur shows in in, in some of the boroughs within uh, that fall under your remit. Yeah so what I would say is that we're following very much so Scotland's route map through and out of the crisis um, and the vast majority of our um, venues are contained within phase three. If you've you know, when you look at that document, although it says the words live events at that point, theatres um, specifically are not called out um, as part of any of the phases. Um, however, there has been, you know, wider speculation that the mass gathering sort of, you know, larger scale events may not return until much later. So we're working really closely with colleagues across um, Scotland and the UK as part of our um, membership of Community Leisure UK and the Scotland arm of that, which is the Members Association for Trusts. We're also linked in with um, you know, the different agencies in Scotland and also with the Theatres Trust, so to try and make sure that we are getting the latest information nationally um, but we're also working closely with partners locally to understand what others are doing and what I can reassure is that um, the team at the theatre have been working hard to reschedule um, with promoters um, shows at points where at the moment we think that that will be a realistic date to potentially target but it's very much a moving feast as you'll understand and appreciate and things do change on a, on a regular basis, but it's something that we're keen to get back as soon as we can, when it's safe to do so. Excellent, that's good to hear we're doing that, enough, but of course, safety first. Yeah. But uh, I take a, a obsession, uh, Brian, are you yes. forgetting about our Booth Abbey Theatre? Yes, it's slightly that. older than your community one, this being in its 56th year. <laughs> Okay, uh, Councillor Miles, you've been very patient. Yes, thank you, Convener. Uh, no, mine uh, has been covered in some ways by, by some of the comments by others. Uh, first of all, I welcome the, the uh, increased uptake in, in most of the activities in the past year, but as uh, Councillor MacDonald indicated, these are kind of past historic figures and we're in a totally different place now. Uh, we've seen with the COVID, most of our, our activities ground to a halt. Uh, what plans or what initiatives do you have in place to try and attract people back in again? Because the sooner we, get, we really get a lot of these things kick started, the better. So do you have any uh, initiatives or plan, planned events to, to take place once the lockdown totally eases? So we've been really keen and working hard to ensure that we remain engaged with people during the lockdown um, because it's actually important to keep those customers connected into the services that um, we can offer um, in a digital or online um, way 
whilst people are um, at home. So we've set up our Angus Alive at home um, page on the website and that helps to promote the different um, services that are available currently to um, our members and also others within the community. We've also been connecting with um, our Be Active members, our library members, and also our theatre goers by um, you know, communicating via email to highlight to them, again, the types of things that they can continue to access and to make sure that they are aware of those whilst they might not be um, services, for example, RB Digital, to ensure that you can you know, still get books to read or magazines to access um, whilst you're at home. And a number of those are things that we would then look to continue into the future to ensure that people can, you know, still have a temporary um, virtual membership of the library without having to physically access a library. It's something that we turned around really quickly to expand that um, access to lots of different people. In terms of the reopening, we have a um, operational recovery group that's working hard to look at exactly what that looks like in each of the different facilities and across the family of services um, and I wouldn't want to give away too much because some of it would be commercially sensitive but I can assure you that we are working hard on that but a big part of it has been trying to make sure that we keep um, our customers engaged um, and um, aware of what Angus Alive does and helping them to stay healthy active and creative at home whilst we're in the lockdown. Thank you. Right then we're asked to note the uh, report we agree to note it? Read. Read. Item 7 are the reports that are relevant to the work of the Scrutiny and Audit Committee. Can I ask Cathy Wiley to speak to this? Cathy, Wiley, could you unmute? Sorry. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, thank yep. you. That's fine. Sorry, I looked at the camera and thought that was me unmuted, so I, I just was on the wrong bit there. Right. Um, so yeah, th this report is the the reports that have been submitted to other Angus Council committees, the Council um, Tayside Contracts and the IJB that are relevant to the work of the Scrutiny and Audit Committee. This report comes to you, I think it's three or four times a year. It was last brought to you, I think in September. So this is just the period um, from then up to now and it's really just for information I don't really propose to be going into any detail with any of it it's just so that you can know about these things because they're relevant to your remit and if there's anything that you wanted to know more about you would be able to ask for that information to come to a future meeting. Okay, um, bids, uh, Councillor Duff. Yeah thanks convener um, and thanks for the report, Cathy. Um, the, the, the one thing I, I just wanted to, the, the, the views of, of committee members really was whether we should um, do some sort of scrutiny and audit on Tayside contracts, because that seems to me to be a bit of a, um, a gap in our, in our scrutiny. We, we obviously have Angus Alive, we've just heard from them. I know that IGB has their own scrutiny and audit um, committee. Uh, chaired by I think Councillor Bell. Um, I just think Tayside contract, I've never been involved in it and I don't know very much about it and is that something we should look at? Can I open that up for comments to the uh, members of the committee? Does anybody else think that we should have um, reports on Tayside contracts so that we can indulge in some scrutiny work? Yes I think so. Anyone strong? Anyone strongly yeah. object? Sorry, Councillor McLaren. Councillor McLaren, were you trying to come in? No, no. Councillor Brace, I think it was coming in. Right, Councillor Brace. Yes, I, I would strongly agree that we should be uh, looking into Tayside contracts. Uh, we put an awful lot of money into that direction, and uh, and and we should. Scrutinise and audit. Anyone strongly object to getting reports on uh, Tayside contracts? Can, can I, uh, yes, although I'm not, yeah, although I'm not objecting, the, the Tayside Contract Committee do scrutinise all the, the, the work of Tayside contracts itself. So uh, just check there's no duplication if you're uh, scrutinising something that's already been scrutinised by the Tayside Contract Committee. So uh, a word with the, the, the convener or vice convener of that would be helpful. Can we pass that to 
uh, the chief executive at the moment to look into how that would be done. Yes. Is that okay, Margot? Yeah, can you? I'll, I'll look at that. Um, I know the board will have a specific remit around its scrutiny, so we need to we need to make sure that we have a locus in that. But we can find that out and get back to the committee before we start any work. Okay, Councillor Whiteside. Thanks, convener. Um, I was looking at page one hundred and fifty-five, report one four two twenty, the review of governance arrangements, and I think uh, because it's such an important issue and it's a small member of that's um, reviewing that, I think the Scrutiny and Audit Committee should also have sight of that as well and, and have some input. Views of the committee? Yeah, yeah fair enough. The outside? Okay, again, uh, can I pass that to you, Margot? Certainly. Right, thank you. Right, that's uh, the items that we think we want to have a look at. Uh, so we've reviewed the reports and we've determined uh, two areas that we want to have further information on. Otherwise, agree the report? Indeed. 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 Can we move on to item number eight? That's Cathy again. Corporate counter fraud review. Cathy, please. Thank you. Um, this is just the um, summary of the activity that's been undertaken by the corporate fraud team um, in the year to 31st March. 2020 and it's really here just for your information and to scrutinise and also to note the results of the self-assessment against the SIPFA code of practice on managing the risks of fraud and corruption which is attached to appendix one. I just want to draw attention to a few a few items in here just around um, the activity in the year. The counter fraud team undertakes a mixture of proactive and um, reactive work throughout the year and just very briefly, um, on page 158 at section four, they undertake corporate fraud reviews, um, which is where individuals have sought to profit from their position as employees. During the year, we concluded nine corporate fraud investigations, and there were four cases that were ongoing at the 31st of March. The type of matters that we've been investigating have been theft of council property, missing monies from council premises, abuse of the flexi time system and um, undeclared conflicts of interest. In terms of council tax, that is um, cited by national SIPFA guidance has been one area where there is potential for quite large fraud. Um, in 2019-20, we've undertaken proactive data matching initiatives and that's resulted in the removal of council tax discounts or exemptions amounting to um, £49,500. And in addition, there have been some allegations of council tax fraud that have been investigated, which have identified potential recoveries of, of just under £16,500. We investigate um, instances where potential tenancy frauds are, are um, reported to us, and there were successful recoveries of seven council properties during 2019-20. The National Fraud Initiative um, happens every two years. The um, matches that we received in early 2019 have all now been reviewed and investigations are complete. And there will be a report coming forward which will be matched up um, with the national publication that will come um, this month, hopefully. During the year, we took part in a voluntary pilot um, exercise through um, National Fraud Initiative looking at non-domestic rates. And um, from that, there were um, four instances where there were some small business bonus scheme payments that had been incorrectly claimed, amounting to just under £11,000. Benefit fraud is the responsibility of um, DWP, however, the counter fraud team does still get involved with that and um, identifies sometimes overpayments of benefits when they're investigating other things, and that has resulted in um, overpayments being identified of just under £27,500 in the year. And we also um, assist the DWP with some of their benefit investigations, and that's identified a further just under £18,000. <laughs> This next item I'm really quite pleased with. Um, the team leader 
um, in counter fraud has developed um, with people from organisational development in, in the council, an online counter fraud e-learning course, um, which has been put up on the Always Learning platform and is available for any staffers in the council. Um, I'm really pleased that we've been able to bring that proactive e-learning um, to, that, to that wider audience. I just want to say a very small part about um, COVID-19. Obviously, this, this arose just at the end of, of the year that we're, we're currently talking about. But we did have, um, we have had some discussion with colleagues in revenue and benefits um, around the response to the potential for fraud in the business grant applications process. And we are receiving quite a lot of information from a, a number of national um, bodies around the frauds that are out there at the moment and the scams that are being um, worked on throughout throughout the country. So we're passing that information through um, the counter fraud team to try and make sure that that's as widely available for colleagues within the council as possible to help them in their own work and also if they're working with people in the community that they can make sure that um, information is available. So at the bottom of page 160 there's a table that just has the the summary of um, all the different initiatives and the potential recoveries that have been identified in each of them. And at the bottom of page, sorry, on page 161, future plans for the team are just to continue working on the proactive and the reactive work that we, that we always undertake. We're considering um, new methods of data matching that may or may not be possible um, with the information that's available. We're going to do some targeted promotion of the counter fraud e-learning course that I spoke about. And the other thing that we've done is we've brought the um, actions that are agreed as a result of counter fraud investigations into the Pentana system. So, excuse me. Um, so that the actions are recorded and it's easier to keep track of them and make sure that they're being implemented and they'll be reported to you along with the internal audit actions going forward on a regular basis. Um, the only other thing just is to say that in Appendix 1, we've got the self-assessment against the SIPFA Code of Practice. It identifies the good practice, the guidance that SIPFA have there, and the evidence that the Council has around its implementation of that good practice with the actions that have been taken and some planned changes that we'll make going forward. Thank you, Kathy. Any questions? Councillor Bell, you've got your hand up. Thanks very much. Thank you, Cathy. That's really thorough. Um, I've, I've got a, a kind of more general query, and you might not know the answer, but somebody else might, um, relating to page 172 and the information security and cyber security policies. Has lockdown and the resultant move to home working exposed our IT and financial systems to um, a greater number of cyber attacks, and could anybody quantify that, please? I'm not able to answer that question. I can come in here, uh, convener. We had a report this very morning, actually, to the corporate leadership team about um, vigilance around cyber security and uh, what we're actually doing about that. So, if uh, a scrutiny and audit committee would like to see that piece of work we're happy to share that that would be great yeah thanks Cathy and thanks Barbara. okay councillor Brays yes uh, just I just noticed in the table here when, when you were talking about uh, tenancy fraud <laughs> and, uh, we recovered seven properties this year against four in the past year or the previous year I should say uh, are those numbers sort of typical of, of what we what we come across? I think they are. I think the number the previous year was something around about that it was certainly below ten. These these are usually investigations that are made as the result of information being brought forward, sometimes anonymously by members of the public through the um, methods that we've got for people to report these things. Yeah, I understand that it can be a hugely resource intensive uh, process. But thank you. Okay, anything else on item number eight? 
We're asked to note the results after scrutinising. Do we agree to note? Thank you. Item number nine. This is the Audit Scotland report on fraud and irregularity. There is quite a substantial number of uh, items on the tables. Can I just point out that the left hand column is what Audit Scotland are asking us to look at. Uh, second column is the internal control uh, weaknesses uh, that Audit Scotland have identified. And the right hand column is the situation in Angus Council. Not all of these items that come from Audit Scotland have anything affecting Angus Council. Cathy. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I think back in August last year, I brought this report from Audit Scotland to your attention and said I would bring something back to you. I'm sorry it's taken so long to pull everything together, but what we have got here. Um, there is some outstanding information that I received from Children and Learning um, too late to include within this report. So I'll bring that to the next meeting um, just to, to fully update that. And there's one other area in here around the use of vehicles where there are just there were just so many areas in the council with vehicles that we didn't include that in the work that we looked at here but we will consider um doing a further piece of work with that on that in future as part of the, the audit plan um okay. audit, audit scotland did recommend that that we should review this in comparison to our own councils to see if any of these weaknesses um applied to us and so that's why um, what, what I've done really in the right hand column there is I've looked at recent counter fraud work, looked at our own procedures and at a really high level in relation to these failures that have happened elsewhere um, and also looked at some of the internal audit work that we've done around those. There's not anything in here that I'm particularly worried about or want to bring to your attention. Okay, has anyone got any questions on this paper? Right, if there are no questions, can we just note the report? Okay, Cathy, again, please, the internal audit activity update report, item number 10. Okay, um, this one now has an um, update on progress with 2018, 19, 19, 20 and 2021 internal audit plans and um, the implementation of the internal audit and counter fraud recommendations. This is the first time that we've brought the counter fraud recommendations to, to the committee. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that in, in a minute. There are two other items in this report just to bring information to your attention. Um, the first one, which is an item um, four on page 183, um, in appendix two to this report, I've re um, I've given you the information that Audit Scotland had published on its website, um, which is a summary of the responses to the COVID-19 outbreak from the scrutiny bodies across Scotland. And I just thought it was important for you in your role as, as, as the scrutiny committee to know what was happening across all of those. I don't intend to say anything about any of them apart from a very brief bit about the Audit Scotland and Accounts Commission um, item. Local, local authority accounts um, are usually audited and, and finalised by the end of September each year. Um, this year, because of COVID-19, that um, deadline has been extended to the end of November. Um, the, the finance team are working to the previous um, September deadline in terms of the preparation of the accounts, and they're currently in conversation with Audit Scotland about the timing of um, the actual audit work that will be undertaken. And I'm, I can't confirm at the moment what the date, the date will be. But I'm not sure if anyone else might be able to update that um, when, when we're finished. Um, and the last bit there on item five, the committee's remit item nine is about promoting and maintaining high standards of conduct by councillors, co-opted members and employees and advising on the adoption or revision of codes of conduct. And it was really just to bring to your attention some of the training that's mm -hmm. taken place during the year that's relevant to you having an oversight um, around the, the standards and the, co the codes of conduct. Thank you, Cathy. Any bids? Councillor Duff? Yeah, Could thanks, I... thanks Convener. Yeah, page 197. Could I... Can, there are one or two other things in this report I would like to bring to your attention. Can I do that? Okay, yes, do that before we take the numbers. Okay, sorry. Um, 
It, it's just to say, obviously, the tables are here around the, the work for the three years plans that are currently in place. I, I'm really disappointed that on a page 187, I'm still sitting with the one item from 2018-19 that hasn't been completed. It, it's been a, one of the casualties of the COVID-19 um, situation. So um, it's back in progress again and hopefully will be reported to the next meeting. You'll see from the table from 1920 that there are a number of items that have been put on hold. Progress has been slowed down, they're delayed. We've got reports out for as drafts that we've not been able to finalise. And it's due to two things. Two members of the internal audit team were um, seconded into the emergency centre, but also a number of the people that we're dealing with to get these audits progressed and um, finalised are also dealing with the, um, the, the pandemic and therefore have not had time and been able to engage with us. Um, on um, page 190, there are two IT governance items that were out as draft reports that had not been finalised when this report was issued. The Eclipse Post Implementation Review and the IT Resilience and Disaster Recovery, both of those are now finalised. Um, and have been agreed and will be coming to the next um, committee and our, our substantial um, assurance reviews. Um, yeah. Sorry, have you got more to say? Um, have I got anything more to say? Well, I've, got, I've just got the items that there's the stock and inventory, user access, housing, Northgate, licensing and data analysis. Um, Three of those are all um, come are all substantial, and I don't necessarily need to say anything about them. Um, but the user access housing Northgate is a limited assurance report, which is the user access information that we um, that we do every year. We take one large system from the, the council and look at it, and this is the third year that we've had limited assurance around the access in a system, and I think. Um, John Morrow from Housing did have um, some information that he wanted to bring to the, the meeting today around um, what's been done around that. And I, I was hoping that he would be able to speak to that at the moment. Is John Morrow available? Yes, convener, I'm here if, if, if you're happy for me to, to do that now. Carry on on the north gate, please. Yeah, yeah, thanks, convener. Um, thanks, Cathy. Uh, for those, those of you who don't know, Northgate is our integrated housing management system um, and it does provide a huge range of functionality to meet our, our diverse um, operational and strategic activities, uh, as probably a lot of you know. Um, the administration of the system, um, which includes version control, uh, remote database management, security and user access is quite complex. Um, and probably as a result of a series of council restructures, going back 15 years, I guess, um, the support given to this aspect um, has probably been a bit diluted, I think. And that's left the housing service with little in the way of direct control over the administration of, of, of what is our core system. And to a great extent, probably some of the resource savings that we've made over the years, um, although made with the best of intentions, have, have probably had a bit of an unintended consequence. Uh, and a bit of a material impact on our business. So last year we conducted a fundamental review of our housing service. Um, some of you will know that as our zero based budgeting approach. And that considered how we could best use our professional skills and resources and systems and processes to deliver better outcomes for our, for our customers and, and, and help achieve the vision that we have. Um, th this included a self assessment of how Northgate assists us in, in those objectives. And what that did was it flagged up for us several areas of concern, not least in how the administration of the system um, is keeping pace of our changing needs as we move to a more digital platform and as we introduce more customer focused um, functionality. The audit then, I think, that has come along that, that, that Cathy has, has described in the report is, has been an integral part of that, that, that review process. Um, and it's essentially reinforced the conclusions that we've already come to ourselves um, during our own self-assessment review. In a sense, it's free consultancy for us, if you like, that supports our objectives for improvement. So we already have a steering group and a working group made up of housing and IT officers and an action plan in place, which will deliver the bulk of the recommendations in the audit by Christmas 
and the rest by the end of March 2021. We've already recruited a temporary full-time administrator, um, certainly for, for the first year, um, and we'll re review at the end of that period. And, and, and that officer will help drive um, the actions forward. So I have to say I'm now confident that we're on the road to getting Northgate back into a shape um, that's going to meet our, our business needs for the, for the short to midterm, certainly, and provide um, a huge increase in resilience so that any business continuity isn't compromised. We've got a lot of actions um, to address the items in the audit. We've got a new system administrator in place who is responsible for housing system administration and support. We have a service development officer responsible for training of staff and, and service improvement activities. Work has started on the next housing upgrade in the system um, with user testing taking place with a go live in July. And the housing working group has put together a test team comprising of staff from, from operational strategic teams, both in, in housing and in IT. The new system will have a completely new and improved user interface, and there'll be a lot of training material um, to help ensure that, ensure that the users become familiar with the, the needs of the system. And there'll be a further review of how we can better use IT to deliver um, housing services in terms of improved services and priorities. Um, the work started and, and that'll be completed in the autumn with some further recommendations on, on the way forward. So all of that means that we'll have a list of, of all procedures that need to be documented. We'll have regular reviews of, of the system administrator and user procedures. We've got two members of staff now responsible for, for those systems administrator duties. Clearly defined user roles and access rights. Um, clearly defined formal processes to control the management of users a quarterly list of joiners and leavers, and, and that will give us improved um, security and better um, user account management. So all of that means that um, I think we've got a robust action plan in place, um, and I'm confident that you know the items that have been um, identified in the audit um, will be addressed over the course of the next few months. Hey John, I'm ready to go for questions now. Uh, I've got uh, Councillor Boyd, page 197. Councillor Braze? Page 197. Number. Again, 197. Uh, Councillor Miles? Yes, mine was on Northgate too, so it's last only been covered, so I'll, I'll Okay, uh, and uh, Councillor Bell? I answered my own questions, but I had another one on page 210 as well, please. Okay, Councillor Devine? 190. 190. Okay, mm -hmm. let's start with Councillor Devine. Right. Page 190. Yes, it's about halfway down the page you've got Pupil Equity Fund. And my concern about this being on hold, Cathy, is that we obviously know that uh, the PEF money is targeted at those children who need most support to try to uh, decrease the attainment gap. Now, having had so much time off, that attainment gap will have increased, unfortunately. I just think that we need to know that the, the PEF money is being used appropriately. Now, I absolutely accept your staffing situation, that the head teachers should all be in place, I think. And I just wondered if there was any chance you could speak a little bit of priority for this one. Um, we are just at the point now where I think that people who have been um, out working on other um, things are probably have a bit more capacity to be able to engage with audit again. So I'm just in the process of picking things back up again. But I can certainly make sure that we put that one at the forefront of the items that we're trying to pick up again. Thanks. I really appreciate that. Okay. Right. Um, on the Northgate system, are you happy with the uh, explanations that's been given so far by Kaiser Duff? Um, yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Morrow for for his fairly detailed um, uh, discussion about what, what the, the sort of uh, recovery plan is. I guess I, ha I had a question which um, I didn't feel was has really been covered in the report. I wanted to know what sort of risk we were taking. Are these risks about the integrity of the allocation process or other potentially financial risk? What are the actual issues that we're trying to sort by improving the user access system? That, that was kind of, that was the nub of my question. 
I think it's mostly about security, but if, if it's okay, convener, I would like to bring Paul Kelly in from Scotland Creefew because they undertook this work on our behalf. Um, I think Paul is on the call. Yes, Paul, please. Sorry, I was just unmuting myself there. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, the risk really here is about, it's not so much the allocation process itself, it's really to do with how people get access and maintaining segregation of duties within the system to make sure they, this is ultimately to make sure, confirm the confidentiality, integrity and availability of the data is uh, maintained throughout the life cycle and processing of transactions. Okay. That, uh, sufficient, guess enough? Yeah, Convener, I, I, I'm taking it there that what we're saying is that, that, that it, the, the system at the moment perhaps is not as secure as it should be in terms of handling individual information. I think, is that what we're saying, is it? Paul? Yeah, I think, I mean, what we found was, as we mentioned, one of the bullet points is that the way user accounts were managed, but there was inconsistency in process. And what you would normally have is the use of user profiles that are consistent. So you've got a team of people who have got very similar access. What we found when we started scraping the surface was that there was nuances on them. So you've got maybe people in similar roles, maybe having different access within the system, which may lead to, to transactions being posted incorrectly and questions about data quality ultimately. Okay, that's enough. Yeah, okay, thanks very much for that explanation. Thank you. Yes, sir, Breeze, you're on 197 as well, that area. Yes, uh, thank you, convener. Um, yes, Mr. Morrow has given a, a lot of reassurance uh, about this. I would hope that he would keep us informed uh, with progress uh, on this. I have a couple of questions, though, um, and I'll ask them all just at once. Yes. The first one's a very basic one. Uh, does money go through the Northgate system? Um, another question is, I wondered if other local authorities use the system. And my final question was on uh, priority three, which I think is on page 119, uh, 199, to do with passwords. And uh, I'm wondering if we're confident that Northgate will up update in order to negate this issue and what will we do if they don't right who wants to answer that one john morrow or paul kelly paul yeah i mean i'm happy i mean it's, there is no direct financial processing to the best of my knowledge through northgate i mean John Morrow may be able to confirm otherwise. But this system, beyond that, in terms of the second question, um, other local authorities use, do use this system. It's a pretty extensively used system in local authorities, both within Scotland and England. Um, on the third question, I think it's probably best for the service to answer that about the passwords. Okay, John? Yeah, yeah thank you, convener. Uh, and th thanks, Paul. Um, Paul's right, there's no money going directly through the system. What, what the system does is it manages the information around the spend on things like repairs and it manages allocations, processes, um, all of that data around um, users, uh, customers themselves is, is, is secure. Um, there are a lot of other local authorities using the system. There's only two or three um, dedicated housing integrated management systems really in use across the UK. Um, Northgate is one of them uh, and has had various guises over the last 20 years, which is when we introduced it just before the year 2000. Um, mostly through that period, it's, it's met our business needs, um, but there are some complexities and vagaries around the system that, 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 that sometimes causes a few issues. And certainly in the longer term, I think one of the things we want to do is review whether the system you know, is going to satisfy our, our needs in that sort of longer term period over beyond 10 years. Um, in terms of the passwords, Part of the actions that we're taking um, in uh, following the audit are around this, the user security access. And as Paul says, um, different levels of activity um, put staff, in, staff users in different groups and they do have different authorization levels. 
So there are security aspects there that we need to bring consistency to, and, and we're confident we'll do that. And the other aspect is, is making sure that passwords are well maintained and, and administered. And again, the, um, the, the staffing that we're putting in place will, will bring a lot more security and, and robustness to the, to the system. So I, I've got no worries about that in terms of the, the work that we're going to do in the next nine months is going to, I think, address all of the points in the, in the audit. Uh, and, and bring us out of a much more secure secure system and one which delivers the kind of functionality that we want uh, going forward. But you are, you are quite confident that, uh, that Northgate will be able to play their part in this? Yes. Y yes, I, I think so. One of the issues has been is, is has been because there's an aspect in terms of the remote database management, which is which is carried out by Northgate, and and we're, we've reviewed that relationship with them, um, and I think probably the engagement that we've had over the last couple of months has improved that relationship. We've got now they have a a better understanding of of what we what we require from them, um, and I, th I see that being much more robust. I think over the course of the next six months. So, but we'll review that. And one of the things we want to do once we've addressed all the points in the audit is to do a further review as I say about kind of that the requirements that we have and whether Northgate and and Northgate the company will will meet our requirements going forward um, it, it will do for the next five years at least but beyond that I think we need to you know have a look again at what, what our needs are going to be uh, going forward beyond that okay okay, okay. participants Sorry, Councillor Miles. No, he, he, he covered my points. Fine, thank you. Uh, right, uh, Councillor Bell, page 210. Thank you. The care inspectorate and, um, you know, not resuming uh, their, their normal routine of visits um, and not doing any joint visits. Essential. I mean, given um, given the prominence of the care sector, and it's very much a mixed model across the whole of Scotland uh, in the COVID uh, crisis, that that gives me some concern, um, and I wondered how we best do that, and if if anyone has anything they could give me um, on allaying my concerns that that that's not going to be as thorough as it really needs to be. Anyone coming in on that one? No. <laughs> I'm not quite clear on the question, uh, convener. Councillor Bell, could you just restate your question? Yeah. It, um, well, given given the the prominence of the care sector um, throughout the COVID pandemic, um, I I felt that the care inspectorates. Um, position in that appendix was a little light touch, shall we say, um, and I have concerns around um, lessons not being learned quickly enough from that, uh, and that people are perhaps ex exposed um, if those issues aren't addressed. Okay, um, so there's there's a lot of scrutiny. If it's to do, is it to do with care homes specifically? Yes, specifically, but the, the, the care inspectorate's position um, there obviously said they're not going to be doing any joint visits or anything um, or less essential. Uh, and I feel that's, that's as thorough as I would feel comfortable with. Okay, I, I think um, our Chief Social Work Officer is on the call too, so he might be able to give you some uh, you know, uh, reassurance around what is happening um, and it would be worth asking her convener to, to come in at this point, Catherine Lindsay. Yes, she's got her hand up now. Good. Thank you very much um, for, for the opportunity to address this issue. So 
Um, at the very outset of the COVID-19 outbreak, the Care Inspectorate took public health um, advice and certainly did um, step down their routine visiting of care homes. Um, and that was to avoid the unnecessary spread uh, by their own officers uh, between the care homes that they visit, because there are thousands of care homes uh, in Scotland and only several hundred staff. So obviously staff would be going from one um, setting to another to another. Um, they have reviewed that, obviously, in light of the length of time um, that the COVID situation has gone on. Um, they have always had a nuanced approach, so they've not said they will not do any visits, but they have taken a very risk-based approach to that. Um, currently, there is a strong oversight uh, arrangement in place, both locally uh, and on a pan side basis. Um, that involves the nurse director, chief social work officers, the Chief Officer and the Director of Public Health um, in consultation with the Care Inspectorate and they will still um, visit homes and in fact have um, a specific statutory duty um, in relation to taking forward any areas of particular concern about uh, care home operation. Um, we are also operationally locally visiting all of our care home providers and we are in uh, daily contact with them um, about uh, how the residents are doing, what support and training, uh, PPE uh, and staffing they may or may not need at any given point in time. So I hope that's in some way uh, reassuring to members. Yes, so well, that okay? Yes, that's really helpful, thank you. Fine, thank you. Anyone else on item 10? Okay, there's a string of things we're asked to note. Do we agree the recommendations? Agreed. Great. Can we move on to item 11, the internal audit report and review of corporate governments. Uh, Kathy, please. Okay, thank you. Um, this is the annual report, which has my overall opinion for the year and also includes some items that I'm required by the public sector internal audit standards to bring to your attention. So, um, first of all, I'm on page 216, there is um, a summary of the overall opinion there at item five. And my, my opinion was that the, or is that the council has a framework of controls in place that provides reasonable assurance regarding the organization's governance framework, effective and efficient achievement of objectives and the management of key risks and proper arrangements are in place to promote value for money. The local code of corporate governance is adequate and effective and although some areas for improvement have been identified and those are going to be discussed in, in further papers today, um, the code is complied with in all material respects. There are a few things that I do need to just bring to your attention in the body of the report. A lot of it is duplication in terms of the work that's gone on that we've already spoken about in the previous item, so I'm not going to go into the detail of those. Um, I did want to draw attention at paragraph 24 on page 223, just that in, in addition to that conclusion that I've um, given, I have had an overview of the council's response to the pandemic and that's provided good positive assurance about disaster recovery planning and practice, managers awareness of the need to maintain good governance and change and risk management arrangements. And I think given that disaster recovery was one of the areas that we weren't able to do the actual piece of audit work around it is it is good to see that that swung into action and, and worked and worked well um the majority of the findings um in in the work that we've done have, have are that the objectives that we've we've sought to assess have, have been achieved um with a number of areas of good practice noted and action plans agreed where we have identified the need for improvement in control environments. At the end of the table there, which as I say is, is the same as the table before, and I'll get to the end of it in due course, um, I think it's paragraph 28, yeah, 28 on page 231, I have drawn attention to the three areas that we had assessed as having limited assurance um, during the year. The climate change target 2020 limited assurance was in respect of reporting and compliance with internally agreed governance arrangements um, rather than um, operational items where we had um, identified that they were operating well. Um, the second one was progress towards a cashless council. Um, 
and that has an action plan to develop a policy and implementation plan. For both of these, um, the actions are due to be complete by September and October, and hopefully the, these will still be able to have been taken forward um, during this last wee while. And the final one is the user access controls on Northgate, which we've already discussed. There's been good progress um, with making with addressing the actions that have been agreed for the things that were identified as limited last year, that's stock, um, environmental health, user access controls on resource link and governance of school funds. There are still a small number of, of um, remaining actions that are outstanding on some of these, but, but they should be complete by the end of September. Um, So the other thing really just to bring to your attention is around the bottom of page 232 in terms of independence, the public sector internal audit standards require me to, to communicate any matters that have a bearing on the internal audit's independence, but I can confirm that the staff members involved in each of the 1920 internal audit reviews were independent of the area under review and their objectivity was not compromised in any way. The other thing that I wanted to draw to your attention is just around about the public sector internal audit standards. We do a self-assessment against the standards of our service every year um, and report that to you and that's in one of the appendices. Um, but every five years we're required to have an external review undertaken and that was planned for the end of 2019. That's been delayed for two reasons. First of all, we joined the, um, the national um, Scottish Local Authority Chief Internal Auditors Group Peer Review Scheme, but their actual process was not actually finalised until the very end of 2019, so that delayed our um, actual review into the beginning of 2020. We did undertake the self-assessment for the peer review and the work was actually started by the peer reviewer, but it was put on hold due to COVID-19 because it required visits to um, Angus for them to interview people and also to look at some of the files that we have. Sakeaga are in the process of redrawing the procedures for this so that they'll be able to do that remotely and I'm just waiting for confirmation of what that's going to be so that we can get this restarted. The peer reviewer has confirmed that they do have capacity to undertake the review once we know what that um, procedures are, what these procedures are going to be. But it does mean that although we're compliant with SIAS in terms of the service that we provide, there's one minor non-compliance in that we've not obtained an external review within the five-year time frame that's required. Um, we won't be the only ones that are in that position by the time we're finished, I'm sure. Um, I think that's everything that I need to um, draw to your attention. There is um, Appendix A does have the, the compliance against each of the individual sections. There are a few areas where we're going to um, make some further improvements, but they're not areas where we don't comply at the moment. It's just that there are some things we could do that, that would make things even better. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Cathy. Anyone got any questions? No questions? Right, in that case, we're asked to note the contents of this report. Do we agree to note? Noted. Thank you. Right. Item number 12. This is the corporate governance, local code of corporate governance, and I think this is Chief Executive. Margot, please. Thank you, Convener. I think Scrutiny and Audit Committee have missed Scrutiny and Audit. It's going on quite a bit today, and we've got lots of questions, which is great. Um, this report advises of the outcome of the review of the local code of corporate governance. Um, it presents the revised local code for approval. As you'll see, the code adheres to the SIPFA and the SOLAS seven core principles of good governance. They are outlined in section four. The report comes to scrutiny and audit every year and is provided to members as an assurance that the council's approach to corporate governance is both appropriate and effective. And with that, I'll say that myself or Gordon Cargill are available to answer any questions on this report. Okay, thank you. Any bids for questions? No bids for questions. We were asked to then approve the revised uh, local code of corporate governments. Do we approve? Does that agree? Thank you. Great. 
Right then, item number 13 is the annual review of the draft annual governance statement. Again, uh, Margaret Williamson, please. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, this report advises of the outcome of the annual review of compliance with the principles of good governance, and it presents the draft annual governance statement for uh, committee's consideration. It's recommended that members consider it and the actions to be taken that are actually outlined in Appendix 1. And committee is also asked to note recommendations 2 to 4. The report comes to scrutiny and audit annually and is signed off by myself and the leader of the council. And again, happy to take any questions on item 13. Okay. Any bids for questions? Bids for questions. We're asked to consider the report and then note the various items. Do we agree the recommendations? Is that agreed? Great. Great. Thank you very much. Ah, turn the papers over at the right place. Okay, the next one is the scrutiny and audit self-assessment manual report. Again, this is from uh, Margot Williamson. So, Margot, please. Yep. Thank you, convener. Um, this, provide, this report provides a draft annual report to Council on the work undertaken by the Scrutiny and Audit Committee during 1920. The committee is asked to review the draft report and offer any comments to determine whether any changes are necessary in light of discussions at this meeting and note that it will be signed by yourself, the convener, and submitted to Council after recess. Again, happy for myself or Gordon to answer any questions. Okay, anybody get bids for questions? No questions? No, not, a, not a question, can be done. <laughs> Councillor Miles? Yeah, not a question, but just an explanation of uh, my lower attendance in some at the, the meetings due to clash with health work meetings. Yes, okay. Thank you. Good better if you could arrange the substitutes. Right, okay, uh, if there's no other uh, comments, uh, do we agree the recommendations? Agreed. Okay, thank you. And finally, uh, item number 15, Children and Families and Justice Service response to COVID-19. Catherine Lindsay, please. Okay, so since the outset of the COVID pandemic, there have been a number of significant changes to legislation, regulation and guidance covering the services that we offer. So we've adapted to practice, but we've taken steps at the same time to minimise the negative impact of COVID on the families and the individuals that we support. This report basically summarises and presents an update on those interim changes um, and the rationale for some of those and invites um, scrutiny of members today. Um, just by way uh, of update, in relation to child protection, um, we did see an initial drop off in the referral um, levels with a, a recent upturn um, looking at our four and six week um, rolling average. Um, and that's encouraging, although it does beg the question what um, will happen to referral levels when children go back to school uh, and health services reopen more fully. So we're anticipating a significant upturn uh, in the number of referrals. Um, all child protection services and our multi-agency decision-making arrangements have continued throughout the period so far. Um, we continue to receive similar number of referrals from Police Scotland um, as we did um, last year at the same time. Um, we currently have 35 children on the Child Protection Register across Angus um, and all of those children are seen in person every fortnight. Uh, in social work we also have another 530 children with multi-agency plans open to us uh, who have been contacted in the last week and that's 77% all the children um, that social workers work with, uh, bearing in mind that usually the contact frequency may be quite a lot lower than that, possibly even as um, any frequently as every month. So we've been um, really diverting our resources to make sure that we stay in contact with the families who need us. In, in terms of uh, your earlier discussion, Domestic abuse has been uh, an area of significant concern with the COVID-19 situation exacerbating a number of existing risks, in particular in relation to women and children within their own home setting. And the report provides some detail on service arrangements and focus that this has received locally uh, and during the pandemic. 
A number of monitoring and support arrangements for those who present a risk of significant harm have also continued. Um, and due to the significance of changes made to contact arrangements uh, between children and family members that they're currently living apart from, that particular element of our practice um, has been covered in the report in some detail for your information. We continue to balance a range of rights and risks in promoting contact between family members um, and we're taking a phased approach to that in relation to the recovery. Another area that's seen significant change in primary delivery formats has been our children with disabilities service and in particular the residential respite services where there's been a reduction in the availability of what we can deliver um, and also um, the, the desire for families to take that offer of service up. So what we've done an enhanced outreach service to ensure that families have some choice and access to usable support and we're working to develop detailed recovery plans for this particular area. You'll be assured to know that our residential fostering and adoption services all remain fully operational and we continue to ensure that staff and carers have the necessary support in place to promote continuity of care for our children and young people um, at this uh, very strange time. Within justice service, the biggest impacts have been through the reduction of new business while the courts are not fully operational, although they are dealing with the most high tariff um, cases. Uh, and of course, the cessation of unpaid work across our communities as a result of um, the lockdown and the need for significant social distancing. This is going to be an area that requires quite a significant degree of thought uh, in relation to uh, reopening services going forward. And finally, whilst maintaining those existing services, teams have worked really hard um, to support the development and delivery of shielding support and hard arrangements that have been led by other areas of the council. So basically what you have there is a whistle stop tour um, of children, families and justice under COVID. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Councillor Devine, you're in for a... Yes, I just have one small question, Catherine, but I wanted to say Thank you so much for this wide ranging report. It's showing how quickly working practices have changed and I'm sure that wasn't easy. Uh, but I, I think we all want to pay tribute to staff for being so flexible and imaginative in the way they've handled this difficult situation. It's very good to see that most of our most vulnerable children have actually had face to face uh, meetings uh, but uh, well, you mentioned yourself, so you'd be expecting even more referrals once children go back to school, I would imagine. Uh, it has been heartening watching this uh, just to see that the numbers have been increasing, albeit slightly, um, and we might want to, to have seen more vulnerable children there, but um, they are increasing. I, I, I just wanted to ask you, because uh, staff have been meeting face to face, and you did say on page uh, 2914.7.4 that they have access to testing. And, and I just wondered if they had all taken that up um, or if you're encouraging that. Um, so in terms of testing, we've had access to testing through our colleagues in the Health and Social Care Partnership and NHS Tayside um, since very, very early on in the pandemic. And the, the access to testing has always been um, in line with the national guidance um, from public health around who should be accessing a test. So there's no routine testing um, as part of um, the Children's Families and Justice Service. Um, the routine testing um, that's been introduced um, nationally uh, has been targeting particularly older people's um, care home services. Um, and that's very much to make sure that that particularly vulnerable cohort in terms of their physical health um, have got a, a, an added element of protection. So whilst our staff are not part of a, a routine um, testing cohort, um, they can access if they display any symptoms um, and have any concerns, they can access testing very speedily through that local arrangement. Um, and we have had a number of staff who have um, taken that, that offer of testing up and a number of family members of staff who are also able to access that. Um, and the reason for that is really to, to reduce our risk of transmission, um, to provide the assurance to the people that we work with and for, um, but also to make sure that if staff um, are displaying symptoms um, but don't have COVID and are actually feeling fit to work, that they can return to work without having a lengthy period just in case uh, of being unavailable. Mm -hmm. 
So it, it's a very reassuring picture um, locally, and I'm, I'm conscious that that's not necessarily replicated um, in exactly the same format across the country. So our health and social care partnership um, have been really supportive. Okay, thank you very much. Isabel? Thank you. And um, exactly what, what Lynn said in terms of our gratitude to, to staff. I was wondering, um, well, I can well understand the um, emotional and mental health impact on our staff for dealing with uh, very difficult situations and including our older people's services. I just wondered, had the uptake of employee support, uh, has it been encouraging? Have people been making the most of that? Um, and any feedback on how helpful that's been? Okay, so I, I don't receive any routine reports on that. Most staff access the support services on a confidential basis. So unless they are sharing that in their supervision with their line manager, which they may or may not choose to do, um, I wouldn't be able to get um, a, a clear figure for that broken down, I don't think, by service, um, unless our HR colleagues may be able to access that. So I, I, can, I can check uh, whether there's anything available. Um, what I do know is that um, recent uh, staff survey results were very positive broadly, um, with the area where the most um, anxiety is being experienced, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, is in our um, residential services. Um, and the, the, the staff and management team there are working very hard um, to make sure that staff are supported. Um, some of the actions that we took very, very early on uh, were to recruit um, a significant number of additional staff on a sessional um, and temporary basis so that we were very clear to the staff group that there was actual practical support available um, and that we weren't going to end up with um, insufficient staff to meet our children and young people's needs. And I know that that was an area that was causing uh, a lot of anxiety at the very outset. Um, so we, we've taken really um, robust action um, very quickly to provide those practical reassurances. But the other sorts of things that team managers uh, and senior practitioners are doing across the service um, is are, they're still hosting team meetings, albeit that they are virtual. Um, for the, the greatest part, they're also holding um, less formal get-togethers, um, cups of coffee and chat sessions um, with staff at key points in the week um, to, to check in on people and to make sure they're okay. All of our supervision uh, arrangements continue to be uh, in place as well. So the full range of support for staff um, continues to be available and of course we plug them into all the corporate offers um, and, and those are being developed and grown as we speak. Thank you. Good. Uh, Councillor Whiteside. Thanks, convener. Just a quick question, Catherine. Um, Lynn already mentioned the, the hubs and the access of vulnerable children at the hubs. I'm just wondering, as the numbers have increased over the, the weeks, has the capacity always been in place to allow every vulnerable child a place in the area where they live? Uh, have you managed to cope with that? Because I know that it's fluctuated quite a little bit. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not aware from our operational staff that they've ever had any concern um, getting access um, within our hubs for children that they have concerns about. Um, and I know that they uh, have been approached often by head teachers um, asking us to help promote um, access um, to vulnerable families as well. We've facilitated some uh, children accessing the hubs by going and physically collecting them and taking them there on a daily basis. Um, so there's a, a real proactivity and a working together across the, the two directorates to make sure um, that where families would benefit from uh, access to a hub uh, and they choose to take that, um, that place up. Um, because again, it is about um, individual family choices and their right to choose that. Um, then we are heavily promoting that uh, where we think it would be of benefit to children. That's good, thanks. Uh, good to hear that's quite a reassuring, Catherine. Thank you. Okay. Is everybody happy with that one? Just double check what the recommendations are. To note, after reviewing, do we agree the recommendations? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your forbearings. I was keeping an eye on the time. I was frightened I was going to have to um, suspend standing orders, but you're, we're within uh, a good half hour of our maximum time. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank See you. Thank you. Thanks, convener. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.